Hi, I'm Ryan here with Samson, and I'm here with Mark Egan. Mark, thanks for being with us here today. How are you doing? I'm really well. I'm coming from sunny London, which is not something I get to say very often. <laughs> I was going to say, you're you're an authority on good video, and you've been ahead of the curve in, regard, in regards to, you know, producing quality video content that especially now is a requirement because, you know, like you can see, everyone's working from home, and you're obviously, uh, you look a little bit more professional than I do at this point. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that, but yeah, you're right in the sense that, um, you know, my mantra has always been that video skills are increasingly important for everybody to have, you know, even if you don't consider yourself to be in the media because it's the form of communication, you know, go on social media, whatever it is. And I think this whole lockdown has been a wake up call to a lot of people who normally maybe rely on like a video crew or something else um, that you need to be self-sufficient. And, you know, that's, that's why, you know, everybody has a phone. So that's one of the things that I teach, you know, make make that into a professional tool. Cool. And Mark, so you've got experience with um, BBC. You've worked with the European Broadcasters Union, the UN, and, and way more people who are far more qualified than I am. Um, you continue to train journalists, marketers, and media pros on how to make professional quality videos with your smartphone. What was the thing that kind of sparked your, your interest and your I mean, really a profession now to be like, hey, this is important. We should get on it. Well, I've always uh, been into video. I mean, my background is I started off in radio. I was a radio journalist and I loved being self-sufficient. You know, if I thought there was a story, I could record it, edit it, feed it back, go to the pub. Very simple. Um, but when across TV, obviously, then you were relying on booking camera crews and edit suites. It became quite cumbersome. So um, I was one of the earlier journalists who would self-shoot like a self-shooting producer backpack, little camera, made documentaries, all that kind of stuff. Um, when I left the BBC, it was just, you know, at the time when smartphones were becoming a big thing. And now at first, smartphones were just the last resort. And even my first experience of using it professionally was when um, I had a camera in, I think it was filming somewhere in Africa, and there was a lot of humidity and the camera started to go a bit wobbly. So I had uh, one of the earlier iPhones, took a shot on that. And when we edit it together, it's like, wow, that doesn't look so bad. But over time, the phone has got better, the apps got better, the accessories, the mics, everything's got better. So it's no longer a matter of if you're absolutely desperate, you know, get your phone out. Your phone can shoot 4K, it can create, you know, really, really high quality content. If you change that mindset that it's not something for playing Angry Birds and looking at the internet, if you actually treat it as a content creation tool. So that's why I'm passionate because before when I taught people on other kind of cameras, often you'd see them three months later and they'll be like, well, I never got access to that camera again. But there's no excuse with the phone. If you have an idea, you pick up your phone, you can make anything. We've had, I mean, Steven Soderbergh, you know, Hollywood film director, did what's Ocean's Eleven, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, he's made two features. So he did Unsane with Claire Foy and he did High Flying Bird. So if you've got Netflix, look up High Flying Bird. And I think that was shot on an iPhone 8. So it's not even like the latest cutting edge iPhone from right now. So you got to understand, well, if people are shooting commercials, music videos, all that kind of stuff on phones, maybe marketers, musicians, uh, journalists, all need to kind of take it a bit more seriously because you know they're capable of really, really high quality content. I was going to say, something interesting coming from a standpoint of a musician, you ask someone, hey, what's the best microphone? And they'll start telling you different makes, different models, and, you know, this and that. Whereas you ask a photographer or a video guy, you know, what's the best uh, what's the best camera? And they'll say the one they have on you. And it's really kind of that utility, like, hey, I have it here. Let me use it. That's that's fantastic. You know, it's, getting in that mindset is a great thing. Well, I mean, I, I would actually throw in another question there is, um, in, what is the best camera isn't always the best question because it depends what you're doing um, and I think the better question is what's the best workflow so for instance if you're somebody who needs to create social media content and you're going to like I sometimes make content um, around things like the consumer electronics show if you're going to something like that you might want to just shoot something chop it together quickly get it up while the hashtag is trending and just being able to do the, all that on one device might be the best tool for that job. And I think that is the great thing about the phone is that I can go somewhere and I could decide, you know what, let's take a photograph. Let's, um, I'm gonna jump on Instagram stories or TikTok or whatever. I can do something on that. I can shoot video, I can edit video. 
it's the Swiss Army knife of media. I can do whatever I want. But that's not to say that, you know, you must never use any other camera or I never touch any other camera. But the, the thing about the phone is it's the one you always do have on you, like you were saying. And that's why I think everybody should, you know, learn to master it. Because even if you are somebody who goes around with your lovely mirrorless camera, um, you don't necessarily always have it on you. So there may be that magical moment, that interview you want to get. So understanding the best apps, how to get the best out of it, I think is something that should be as base a skill as typing. So if you work in the media, marketing, journalism, something like that, you're expected to type. Nobody's going to come and type your uh, emails for you. In the same way, being able to create a certain quality of professional video is something I think is becoming a baseline skill that everybody should have. Yeah. So Mark, with, with people who are, are getting into it and trying to figure it out, you do trainings for people across the world. What are some of the common questions you get from someone who's just starting like, hey, what do I do? You know, where, what gets kind of repeated there? Well, I think, um, I mean, there are obvious questions to do with, oh, which apps should I edit on? And, you know, which microphone should I get? That kind of thing, which, you know, we can go into. Um, I think the, 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 the two kind of common um, things that people get wrong is, you get complete beginners and they do what we call spray and pray where they just get their phone out and start press spraying it around and pray there's something in that they can use but you also get people who are used to other cameras who um don't adapt their shooting style so they are used to big huge cameras or cameras with big long lenses and they start zooming in and out and moving the camera around you know your phone um, has got a small sensor it doesn't like to be moved that much unless you have a stabilizer so you just have to adapt your shooting style so from both ends people tend to just go a little bit crazy rather than playing to the strengths which tend to be shooting with a plan having you know a mixture of shots you know don't move the phone around too quickly too much unless you have a stabilizer um the other thing that i think people really struggle with when they first start is um they say to me editing is difficult well editing is really difficult when you shot a load of rubbish but if you have had a plan in your head and you thought, you know, this is how I want my video to start. These are the shots I need. This is what I need somebody to say. How am I going to end it? Um, then you go and you just basically get the shots you need and you can put it together easily. It's when you shoot lots and lots and lots of things. And then you sit there and you think, right, how do I turn this into something? That's when editing seems difficult because you're trying to fix it in the edit. So one of the things I teach is kind of visualize what you want to do. You can always, when you go and turn up at the location, think, you know what? Not sure that's going to work. Let me think of plan B. But you should never be shooting a video without in your head being able to see the video. Because especially on a phone, you've got limited battery and limited memory. So the more you can plan about, okay, what would be a great opening shot? What do I need that person to say? Then you can go bam, 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 put it together in the edit, and you're done. Cool. And so speaking of editing, Mark, are there any uh, apps that you recommend for editing a video? And are you editing mostly on the phone? Are you editing on the computer, a mixture of both? A mixture of both. Um, again, if you're on location, you want to get something done quickly, then um, I mean, the two, there are a few fantastic apps out there. I'd say the best app for iPhone is called Luma Fusion. And that's incredible. I mean, that's almost like having Final Cut Pro on my phone or my um, iPad, uh, but it's only iOS. Uh, there's one called Kinemaster, K-I-N-E-M-A-S-T-E-R for Android, which is pretty good. And there's Adobe Premiere Rush, which can work on, on both. Um, so, and there's a, if you're looking for a free one, there's one called VN, as in the letters V and N, a video editor. That's pretty basic, but you could cut something. Um, but yeah, it depends what I'm doing. So if I'm doing something that's going to take a lot of time, or maybe sometimes I'm doing something for a client, and they have graphics and stuff that need to be dropped in, then I might move it to a desktop. If I'm doing something on location, something quick, something for social media, I'm happy to do it on my phone. I actually find editing on the phone like really good fun because it's tactile, you can drag around. It's like, if you ever seen Minority Report with Tom Cruise, where he's like dragging stuff around, um, it's kind of like that. And I think my prediction is eventually that's the way editing will going. I mean, I'm not sure in 20 years time, people are gonna have a mouse scrolling along. They're gonna have some kind of big table that looks like an iPad and they're dragging the clips around. I think that's kind of the way it will eventually go for everything. Well, you heard it here first, everyone, you know, put your patent in and we'll go from there. No, and then, so now we've adopted the phone, we're using it, what's the single kind of biggest upgrade or what do you do after you get the phone to kind of make your videos the next level? Well, I think um, when it comes to accessories, um, I mean, I won't show you what 
what's around me in my office but i've got so many kind of gadgets and stabilizers and everything you actually only need uh, sort of three main things you need stability so whether that's a stabilizer like a 3x's gimbal or um, a cheap tripod or something um you need audio you need a microphone and i mean obviously if you have nothing else you know and you have your phone you know, maybe the kind of little earphones you use to make your phone calls, you know, especially on the iPhone, they work pretty well. Um, they're definitely better than the internal mic. The internal mic on a phone is too far away from whoever's talking or if it's you. Um, so often <coughs> often the audio is not very good. The other thing is, let's say you're doing a live on Facebook and you say, hey, let's look at what's over there. You flip the camera around to the other camera and the microphone will switch to the, the microphone on the back. So we stop hearing you. So again, having an external microphone is really, really a big deal. And then if you can get a little LED camera light, like a little light um, that will sit on top of your phone. So if you're in dark situations, it will just throw a bit of light. Um, so you know, the minute you start doing that, you need some kind of little um, a cage or mount to put it onto your tripod, uh, put a little cold shoe with a light on the top. So, but you know, literally to get started, you could be spending, you know, fifty dollars to have a little basic kit. The more you spend, um, the better it is. Um, and then, you know, it depends which level you want to go to. I mean, for instance, um, you know, wireless mics. I mean, you know, something like this. Obviously, uh, you recognise these. Um, Samsung Go Mic Mobile. I mean, what's exciting is that stuff is starting to be made for mobile phones. So, um, it, because it's mass market, it's quite cheap. So lots of the equipment that you get for, for phones um, is actually very, very affordable. So get yourself some stability, get yourself some audio, and if you can, get yourself a light. Obviously, you need something to mount it to the tripod. So, you know, those little kind of things like that you get on the top of a selfie stick, mm -hmm. get one of those. But you can go to companies like ShoulderPod or um, Beast Grip or Lanzi. There are lots of them out there. And you get yourself a nice little mount that lets you mount um, lights on the top and all that kind of thing. So those are the three things I would really, really focus on. Wow. So I was going to say, looking at some of your videos on YouTube, um, you've got some gorgeous background shots going on. And that's obviously a way to kind of make video more interesting is, is having your subject. And you, you speak a little bit about um, having the shot match your location. Uh, right now with us in quarantine, how can we kind of bring some of that excitement that you have from instead of having a mountain or a river or waterfall behind you how can we kind of bring that to our regular everyday video well i mean i think the videos you're talking about what i tend to do and this is the th thing i love about mobile is um let's say you're doing marketing videos so if i'm making little tips about shooting on your smartphone um you know i could be in delhi and it's everyone's beeping their horns it's really noisy and i think you know this would be a great location to talk about um, audio. Uh, so you, you do it there. But even if you're in your own local area, um, you know, depending on what kind of videos you're making, find an interesting location. Almost anywhere has got an interesting location. So where possible, get out and about, take your viewer on a journey. But if you're, I mean, doing stuff from home, I mean, like where I'm right now, I'm in an office. Um, so obviously you can use stuff you've shot before or stock shots. Um, if you're talking about the actual setup that you have i mean um my kind of secret weapon is um smart bulbs so for instance if you have um like an office and you just want to make your background look a little bit more interesting um obviously things like tv screens can work really well monitors um and then i mean behind me i've got a lamp with a, a smart bulb so i can go onto my phone and change the colors so you can kind of just give it a little bit more of a kind of a tv studio look um but yeah, I mean, I don't think anything really beats getting out there, being mobile, taking your viewers to interesting locations. So whenever I shoot a video, I normally try to just be somewhere where it's either beautiful or it's relevant to the topic I'm talking about. So um, whether that's light and I'm on the beach when the sun's going down, I'm talking about soft light, you know, try and take people there and show them because it's video. Yeah. And and Mark, I know you're in London right now. I'm in New York. Uh, and it's it's great that again that you're here and we're able to do this across the Atlantic right now. Staying connected is more important than ever. Uh, what have you been doing kind of during quarantine? What has changed in terms of you you making videos? Obviously, more from home now. But well, if you were to sum up my kind of lifestyle before, it would be um, 
shooting um, around big events like big tech events like you know CES type things um, it would be flying to places around the world and getting people into a room and training them um, on video and literally every single one of those is like the worst thing in the world you could do right now so I mean there was two days where my emails were just ping 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 with cancel 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 and my whole year of work just evaporated within two days so at that point you're like oh, okay this could be interesting um but what's been exciting is that i've just translated all that training to online so on things like zoom and um i for instance i've created a little sort of home studio here with a little vision mixer and um you know got lights different angles and i've just sort of thought right well let's embrace this and what I found is that it's different, but it can be good. It's not a matter of just because somebody's being trained on Zoom, it has to be like a terrible experience. You have to adapt it the way you do the exercises. But for instance, you know, I can literally be doing a training for somebody in, you know, Denmark or Sweden, and then later on doing training for somebody in Egypt or getting up early to do something in the Far East. So in a certain way, what it's allowed me to do is, um, connect with people all over the world train people up and still go down and have a cup of tea afterwards um so i do miss seeing people i miss going to the locations but i do not miss airport security because when you have the equipment i have going through airport security literally you see the blood drain out of their faces they see the x-ray and it's just like oh my goodness what is in that bag so that's the bit i don't miss but um but yeah i mean we're in the age where people are working from home so my my normal day now is getting up um and if i'm uh, training i'm jumping on some like zoom and then when i create videos it's often um you know getting up there delivering some training or a video and then using either stock shots or stuff that i've shot in the past to illustrate what i'm talking about so um so yeah i'm looking forward to getting out there and shooting some new stuff i was gonna say your point about airport security is great i've done a couple of trainings as well and you'd think people have never even seen or heard of what a microphone's supposed to look like when they see <laughs> 10 coming through my carry-on. They're like, what is this? So I'm, <laughs> I'm not missing the uh, the lack of pat-downs in my life. But <laughs> Yeah, I, I know exactly that feeling, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, in a sense, the um, w this whole thing, I think, has shifted a lot of what I do in the sense that um, not just the delivery, but before, when you said to people, you know, you should really master your phone and be able to make videos from anywhere. Uh, it was like, yeah, it's probably a good thing to do. But when lockdown happened, especially like journalists, there were journalists who couldn't get access to camera crews or whatever. And the ones who could work from home, we had people um, creating TV programs from home, you know, shooting stuff, editing it, getting other people to shoot things for them and sending it and running entire TV programs themselves using mobile so i think this has been a big wake-up call to people that the kits out there the apps are out there you know there's there's no excuse now you need to be empowered to make video yeah and then kind of going forth with what you were saying your your workflow is um you get the idea you get the story and you were mentioning having the video kind of laid out in your head what is some of the things that you actually do um to kind of plan that and to kind of follow through on everything well, I think um, uh, first thing you th always think about, okay, so who's the video for? What platforms are going on? Who's it for? And what do you want the viewer to do at the end? So is it a marketing video or is it a journalism video? Um, so that the very first thing, I don't care what video you're making is, how are you gonna hook people in, in the first four, five, six seconds? So that could be, say a marketing video, it might be a promise of, you know, here's the one thing that will completely transform your smartphone videos and then people watch on to find what that is. If it's a new story, it might be a great quote from somebody saying, um, this is awful, this has to stop, we must do something about this, and then you lead into your story. Um, so that's the first thing, you're kind of planning um, who's the audience, so therefore you get an idea of how long it is, what kind of style it is. And then you know, think about, am I gonna be narrating this? Are we gonna do text? Is the person I'm filming gonna tell the ho their own story? Because if they're telling their own story, then you need to interview them so that they tell the story themselves uh, so it makes sense that when you edit it and then um, um, yeah I'll then put it into whichever editing either the app or the software um, put it together and I think that's again the great thing is that you could sometimes chop it into different versions on different apps for um, different things like there's one app that I really love for Instagram stories called Mojo 
Um, Mojo is the short for mobile journalism. So um, it allows you to use templates and nice graphics coming across and you can create something beautiful on that. If I'm doing something that's a little bit more kind of high end, then it'd be Luma Fusion. Or if I have a lot of time, I might move it on to Final Cut Pro. Um, so that's generally the workflow. See it in my head. What shots do you need? How are you going to lead people through? So let's say it's a one minute video. You know, you sorted out your first few seconds, how you're going to hook them. But then you need to think, well, how am I going to keep them watching? And then at the end of the video, is there a call to action? Is Do we ask for comments? Do we say go to our website? You know, what do you want? Because once you've got that in your head, it takes away the fear factor. Because if you don't have that, when do you know you're finished? You go and you film somewhere and you keep filming. Um, whereas if you know what you need, you go there and you say, I need that and you need that. You do the interview, you get just what you need, and then you leave. Um, and I think that's the value. It, in a weird way, um, in the old days of like film cameras, the camera crews used to have to be very disciplined about what they shot. And then digital video came out and everybody just went crazy because, hey, let's have like 15 hours of you know video. F smartphones is almost like going back to film and saying we've got limited battery, limited memory. Um, let's be a lot more disciplined and a lot more structured about what we shoot. So that's kind of the way I approach it. Gotcha. So now in, in your head, if you're shooting a, a video for say Facebook versus YouTube versus Instagram, what are kind of some of the different time lengths you're shooting for? Like is, is one more long form than the other? And obviously you can edit the same content to, to fit what platform you're using, but uh, what are those kind of goals in your mind? Well, I think the first thing, and it's one of the big questions you get asked is, should you shoot vertically or landscape? And unless you are only shooting for a vertical platform and that's the only place it will ever go, I always say shoot landscape, but shoot 4K. So if you shoot very high quality, you can chop it up into whichever shape you like. So for instance, you might want to put it on IGTV and have it vertical video. You might then say, let's stick it on um, my Facebook feed and actually let's make it square. Because if you shot landscape, you can do anything. If you shoot vertically, you can't really make that work in landscape. Um, you know, then, I mean, for instance, um, Instagram, if it depends whether you're just going to post on the feed, which is going to be under a minute, but probably 35, 40 seconds is about right. Um, if you're for something like Facebook, I know they're now encouraging longer videos, but generally you're talking, you know, one, one and a half minutes for videos, really. And YouTube can be longer, you know, depending on, on the content. So if you're doing a review video, people are happy to watch a lot more of it. I think the, the thing that people need to concentrate a bit more on though is um, for instance, on Instagram, the things that will help you are consistency, but also engagement. So is your video um, starting a conversation? Is it getting an emotional reaction from people? Are they likely to do something afterwards? You know, are they like to like it, post comments? Um, and I think some of the video I see is very much kind of, I am here to speak to you and it's not, you're not really kind of building a conversation. So um, I think just especially on things like the call to action at the end, you know, ask for the comments. If you're on YouTube, for instance, start with a hook, then maybe introduce yourself, ask for the subscribe, and then carry on with your video. So, um, so yeah, those are the kind of the different lengths. But I think the concepts are all the same. Hook at the beginning, keep leading them through, try and make the duration right for that platform and have a call to action at the end. Cool. So Mark, just with your vast experience uh, kind of globe trotting for all these stories, what are some of the coolest places that mobile journalism or journalism in general has, has taken you? Well, I mean, um, I mean, I've been all over the place. I've been to, you know, Cambodia, China, Cape Town, um, obviously US. So, all, I mean, I, you know, when they have those things on Facebook where you tick how many countries you've been to, um, it's literally, you know, Greta Thunberg would hate me. It's, um, I've been to like so many places. Um, but that just shows the trend and, you know, how many people are interested in this. But I mean, when you look at the mobile journalism side of things, it's really exciting because you have, um, you know, for instance, in Ireland, RTE, um, they were kind of pioneers there. There's a lot going on in the, in the Netherlands. We're increasingly seeing more from the States now, lots of newsrooms now trying to be more efficient and then starting to use phones. Um, but I've, yeah, I've been to lots of different countries. Um, but yeah, it's funny. I mean, you're talking about kind of like memories and, you know, stories you've shot. Uh, there's one story um, that popped into my mind the other day. It was actually before I started shooting on mobile phones, but it was a, a really good, I was actually thinking that's where I really learned my lesson to do with 
audio because again we're talking a lot about you know shots and 4k and shapes and all that kind of thing but when it comes to audio i was looking at twitter the other day and there was um a name trending which was nick nurse and i thought oh, wait a minute i know that name where do i know that name from and i remembered what it was and it was like when i first started shooting nick nurse was a basketball coach with a team called the brighton bears and he came over from america and well i think he's american or canadian he came over from north america and um he coached this team and he got them to the final and i was sent to do a story to film him so basically i could go in on the court you know with the fireworks going off i could sit beside him i could you know go into the locker rooms everything um and what i decided to to do is i put a, a wireless mic on him and so i followed him and basically the first you know half of the game or two quarters was going really badly so it's a big arena thousands of people so we go in during the kind of break into the locker room and you got all these guys slumped over with like towels around the necks and he's there and he gives this like hollywood style inspirational speech um and then all through the game he's like screaming and shouting and saying this stuff and then he comes up to me just before the end and they, they've turned it around and they're going to win and he hands me the wireless mics back and he says i'm about to do something stupid i should give you these back and when it finishes, he like stage dived into the crowd type thing. Um, but when I look back at the footage, the real eye open was is I was thinking about all the fantastic shots I had, but the absolute like killer material was the audio, the little interactions, the little thing he said to some of the players, the the speech at half time. And ever since then, um, I've always sort of thought how important audio is. So if I go and film an athlete, whereas often people will have the athlete running around doing their training and then do an interview. I would say, do you mind if I put a wireless mic on you? Because them going <laughs> is far more powerful than just the visual itself. So, yeah, in a sense, when I think back about different places, I've been different stories, you kind of learn a different lesson at every single one. And that was one that popped up recently. And I was thinking, yeah, that's why for me, you know, um, audio, and I'm not just saying that because it's you, um, audio has always been something that I emphasize. Because if you can get the audio right, people might forgive a shot that's not brilliantly framed. But if they can't hear what's going on, they won't forgive you. Yeah. No, I mean, especially coming from the musician standpoint, I'll, I'll watch a video that takes a second to get in focus if it sounds good. But if it doesn't sound good, I'm turning it off within the first three, four seconds. So that's that's something that, you know, I'm, I'm here for a reason. I, I appreciate it. And it's something that kind of, I think, pushes a lot of good video to another level. Um, so, Mark, you do. Yeah. I... Oh, sorry. No, I was, I was just going to say, I think um, uh, the the fortunate thing is, like I was saying, is that um, when I first started going down this route, it was something hard to get accessories and all that kind of stuff. Whereas now, um, I mean, when it comes to kind of how far smartphones has been developed since I've been involved in this, it's incredible. I mean, one of the um, figure that blew my mind was Charlie Rose did an interview with Tim Cook a few years ago. And Tim Cook said they have at Apple, just Apple, 800 people working on the iPhone camera, just connected to the camera itself. And you think, well, why? Well, what makes you upgrade your phone? It's the camera. So that's why the phones, even though when there's like an announcement like the other day, everybody says, oh, it's not much, that much different. You know, you pick up a phone from even like four or five years ago, and as far as the cameras go, massive difference. So, you know, I predict that we're gonna get to the point where like the mirrorless cameras and the phones are gonna kind of come closer and closer together till they kind of merge and have like a love child where you're not quite sure whether it's a camera or a phone but they both have the same kind of similar functionality so yeah i don't think this whole trend is going anywhere no I, it's here to stay and especially even more so with people realizing that hey it's okay to be at home and sometimes enjoying it more than being in the office or you know i have a couple friends who have who have moved to uh kind of islands in the caribbean they're like i just work from here now so I, that's a good plan. I might need to follow that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think um, as far as working from home, um, I'm in, enjoying it a lot more than I would like, even though it's, it's been a bit of a shift. And again, um, you know, talking about kind of home studios and things, um, the number of people now asking me questions and they might work in banking, but they're asking about, um, you know, what camera can I get? What webcam? Uh, how do I get decent audio? So, um, you know, for instance, a lot of people are doing the audio just from their laptop, which nowadays is not good enough. Because if you show up for a meeting and you work in a business, you're expected to kind of dress well and present yourself well. So if you are now in even something like banking and you're turning up on, you know, calls on Zoom or whatever it is and it doesn't look professional, 
that's kind of not great. So now a lot of people are also embracing the idea that they have a corner of their office or at home and they're turning it into like a, a little mini studio. So again, video skills have gone from being something only a few have to more and more people are taking seriously. So, Mark, you're an absolute wealth of information. Um, I know I can find you on, on YouTube, on Mark Egan Video. Um, where are some of the other places we can find you um, just in general and even for trainings and consultations? Yeah, uh, well, it's uh, markeganvideo.com is my website. And, yeah, I mean, if if you uh, – I, I have online courses and things, but if, um, if you need me to maybe even at one day be released into the wild and come and visit you or alternatively if you do it down Zoom – uh, you can contact me on there, but um, and yeah, I'm, I'm at Mark Egan Video on Twitter and Instagram and all that, so you can send me hate mail there. Perfect, Mark. Thank you so much for spending your uh, your lovely evening with us. I know it's one of the couple days you get sun, so I appreciate you spending it with us. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. I, yeah, I'm starting to like sweat here. It's kind of so warm in here. I'm not used to it, but uh, but no, it's been great talking with you. And um, yeah, obviously you over there as well. Stay safe, and um, I hope. Um, things will get back to normal for you soon. Thanks, you too. Have a great one, everyone.